Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the August Agency Services Bridge Meeting. We're going to get started because uh, I'm sure you saw from the email, we have a packed agenda today. Uh, a lot to talk about. We want to make sure that we have enough time, not only for the presentations, but for some of the discussion and Q&A um, that I expect will happen as part of some of the presentations. Um, just a, a few quick uh, announcements before we get started um, of the administrative category. Uh, for everyone in the room, um, I just want to remind you that we do have microphones on the aisles. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, um, and then just tell us who you are and from what agency you come from. Um, this is so very important, not only so we can hear you in the room, but so that the people who are joining us via the webcast can also hear the questions and the exchange. Um, for those of you who are joining us via the webcast, um, if you have a question, please do the same. Uh, tell us your name, your agency, as you put your question into the chat, and we are monitoring it up front, and we will make sure your question gets asked. Um, the other administrative announcement is uh, later today, as we always do, um, will be our meet and greet session with NAR staff. Today it's hosted by appraisal teams two and four. So if you are an agency that is, uh, works with our appraisal staff in appraisal teams two and four, um, please join us at one o'clock. Uh, the meeting will be in the uh, Washington room. Um, which is upstairs in the presidential conference rooms. Um, so we usually have those run from one to three. Um, we'll have some presentations and a lot of uh, opportunity for discussion. Um, I will note also as part of my presentation later that I will be there for the first hour of the meet and greet. If anybody has questions about uh, the memo that we're gonna be talking about, um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions um, during the meet and greet session this afternoon. So, um, Without any further ado, let me go to, if it will let me. Okay, that was too fast. Let me go one more. Uh, just quickly on the agenda, you can see what we have lined up. We have, we'll have Gordon coming up next to talk about some updates from the FRCP, and then Jay and I will talk about the memo. We have some guests from GSA who are gonna talk about uh, what they are doing in support of M1921. Don Rosen is here to give us a preliminary update on uh, the reporting data and where we are with producing the annual report and what we have seen so far. And then we will close the meeting with a segment on training and I'll turn it over to Gary uh, later to introduce uh, Michelle and Jill who are gonna be talking about different parts of what we're doing with the training program. So a lot to cover. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get through it and get you to lunch on time. Um, and, uh, and then we'll see some of you back here in the afternoon for uh, the meet and greet with appraisal teams two and four. So with that, I'm going to advance the slide, hopefully. And I will turn it over to Gordon. Don't touch the keyboard, she said. <laughs> Good morning. And welcome to the end of summer. I see uh, no one's happy about that. But we're here at the end of summer and back to school and all of those things. And we're getting uh, close to the end of the fiscal year and the start of 2020. So I know the question from you all is, where is my interagency agreement for 2020? And we've had some calls from customers and I can assure you that uh, we'll have those to you uh, by mid-September, the account managers will have that. We're uh, wrapping that up, getting the rates all finalized and approved. Uh, so look for that in mid-September. Um, and that would be all of your interagency agreement, your funding documents and all that we will have out to uh, all customers. The next thing I wanted to uh, just kind of make you aware, if you, we sent out a memo um, to customers around disposal and some of the issues or circumstances that we're having with a disposal backlog and some of the FRCs. And you may have received that from your account manager uh, just to kind of alert you that about this backlog, it's not in every FRC, it's just in some of the FRCs as we work through uh, new contracts to make sure we meet the ISOO requirements. We do expect to have, by first quarter, to have those contracts in place uh, and to uh, get that backlog down. So if you see that, if you see you've given us some concurrence and 
some of those uh, uh, boxes are still uh, present. That is the reason you may see that. Uh, and if there's a concern, please let your account manager know or let myself know, um, and uh, we'll update you further um, if there are some major, major issues around that for you. One of the new programs that we're starting in uh, 2020, uh, there's been a lot of conversation around CUI. Uh, there have been several presentations here at Bridge around CUI, and so the Federal Record Center program is ready to go uh, beginning October the 1st with our CUI program. Uh, you should know that all of the Federal Record Centers can store CUI uh, records in, in each of our uh, 18 facilities. So you can be comfortable with that. If there is some special or enhanced storage that you need on CUI documents, we're doing that in three facilities around the country. We're doing that in San Bruno, uh, FRC, Kansas City, and we're doing it at WNRC out in Suitland. Now, Last year, and we may need to do it again, the account manager sent out to most customers uh, in your holdings that we thought items were CUI, and we really need uh, customers to give us feedback on those records so we can update Arcus to make sure we uh, uh, have updated Arcus on what you consider CUI. Some customers have responded, some have not. And what I think we'll do is send those holdings out to you again and so you can tell us, hey, this is CUI, and you know, how should we handle these documents if they, or these records, if they should be handled or disposed in any different manner. So look for that from your account managers also, uh, because we want to make sure that we've documented uh, all of the uh, uh, CUI uh, records for customers. So with that, those are the three updates I have. Uh, any questions around uh, now or 2020 for the Federal Record Center program? Any questions online? We have one question. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Andrea Jenkins. I am with USDA Rural Development. I work, we have 47 state offices, so we work with all the federal record centers across the country. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems that I'm running into is that not all the federal record centers work in the same way. I'm getting, you know, we're trying to train our records liaisons in, in the field on how to transfer records to the Federal Record Center. Mm -hmm. We have, um, the records liaisons are the ones who fill out ARCIS. And the transferring office, we require that they f still use SF-135 as the record inventory, the box inventory, okay. and attach it. Now some of the Federal Record Centers will send an email to the transferring office when the records when the approval to ship has occurred. Um, they also attach like a stamped, their version of the 135. Mm -hmm. But I'm finding out not all the federal record centers do that. And so I'm getting all these questions from over 4,000 people that I work with on how are we supposed to do this? Okay, and, and how you get that notification uh, if those records are approved to send in at FS 135, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it's just that it's not uniform across. Okay. All let, me, let me take that to our operations folks and see how best we can resolve that. Um, you know, if we can do it, you know, if it should be an email or if we can do it through Arcus. I'm not sure if we can send a notification through Arcus, but I'll check with our uh, uh, operations folks and see what's the best way to communicate and hope we communicate that across the board for all the centers to do the same thing. Yeah, and we're fine with however you want, however it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. The problem is uniformity right. and being able to convey the same information to all of our 47 state offices. Okay. Are all of the 47 state offices using Arcus? Not all of them, all but of them. A, a good portion is. Okay. We'll take that back and uh, let me take that back and have a discussion around that. You said USDA? Yes. Okay, and I'll have, uh, I think that's Andrea Shear. I'll have Andrea follow up with you. Okay. 
Any other questions this morning? Okay. If not, um, we're going to bring Lawrence back up. Thank you. So um, I'm going to make an assumption before we start uh, the session on OMB in 1921. Actually, maybe I'll make a couple assumptions. One, I'll assume that most, if not all of you, are aware that there is a new memo in town. Is that a fair assumption? Okay. Second assumption I'm going to make is that many of you here, uh, and, and also those of you who are joining us via the webcast, um, may have been at the August 1st meeting that we had in this room with the Senior Agency of Federal Records Management and the records officers. So for those people, you are going to hear a very similar presentation. Obviously, the memo is what the memo is, and we're going to be talking about the memo. But we wanted to make sure that we had this presentation at Bridge so that we can reach everybody in the records management community, records officers, records liaisons, and give you all the chance to, uh, to hear it from us and hear the questions from others in the community and be able to ask us questions directly. Um, I do want to say, uh, before we get into the presentation, that we've allowed about 30 minutes for this presentation, which is quite a bit less time than what we used um, to plan out the August 1st SEOR meeting. So uh, I will extend the offer for anyone who wants to come by uh, the appraisal team to and for meet and greet at 1 o'clock, but may not work with appraisal team to and for, but you have some questions about the memo, you are welcome. I will be there for an hour and be happy to answer any questions you might have at that time if you're able to stay uh, through lunch and then join us at 1 o'clock. So um, with those assumptions and that invitation, i um, very happy to have Jay Trainer. Thank you. Uh, executive for Agency Services uh, sitting up beside me for cover and to answer questions uh, that are probably, you know, more specific to the record centers and storage of temporary records, which, which Jay oversees. Um, so hopefully between the two of us, we can, we can attempt to answer. We'll make a very good attempt. Yes, we will. We will try. Um, okay. So we will proceed. Um, and if you have questions during the presentation, um, just please hold them till, till we get to the end. We, we, we only have a few slides to run through, and then we want to reserve most of this time for your Q&A. So as Lawrence said, obviously the um, Managing Electronic Records Directive is, is uh, sitting there. Uh, but before we get to that, um, we don't need a DeLorean, but we'll go a little bit back in time. To, um, you know, the, the road that we've all been on here in our private lives and also here in the federal government of this transition to electronic records. Um, again, we can, we can all see it in our private lives. We can also see it here at work um, that a lot of records um, that used to be created um, in various textual formats have, have migrated to the electronic world um, and some new records that are created through either new agencies or new um, government initiatives um, were from the get-go created uh, electronically. Um, but if you go just back to 2012, we have the um, management, Managing Government Records Directive um, that really for the first time put out this marker for um, the entire executive branch to begin um, moving to uh, better managing electronic records. And there were two key dates in there with uh, 2016 on the email and here in 2019 with the uh, managing all permanent electronic records in electronic formats. Um, then more recently we have the uh, NAR strategic plan um, that obviously had the end of 2022 date in it, but also had markers out there for NARA to um, do work with uh, what we call um, Fermi and putting out um, electronic records requirements uh, for um, the executive branch. 
but also some digitization standards and um, not necessarily Lawrence's and I, our group, but um, the ERA 2.0 processes that um, NARA will need to help the federal government manage electronic records. Um, if you then go just very recently, you have the, um, with this administration, you have the government reform plan in uh, June of last year, and then that moves to, um, or puts the marker out that um, the government needs to conduct its business um, electronically. Um, but there were also markers in there um, that we all have been under, either from sequestration or hiring freezes to, um, you know, trying to shrink the government footprint in terms of staffing, but also in terms of uh, real estate. And so then very recently you have the OMB and NARA uh, transition to electronic records. Um, and this is obviously a huge step um, and one that we're here to talk about today. Thanks, Jay. So going to the next slide, we're going to, uh, oops, sorry. Um, I should have advanced the slide. Now we're going to get to the next slide. We're going to talk in a bit more detail. Okay, if it stays right there, that will be good. Um, about the targets in the memo. So um, there are seven. Um, on the next two slides that I'm going to talk about, and we're going to start uh, with 2019 and walk up the steps. These are the first series of targets that appear in the new memo. So um, one thing that I'm sure you're all aware, this new memo, M1921, replaces uh, M1218. So what we had to do was make sure that all the important stuff that was in M1218 that we wanted to keep working on, like managing email, making sure that there's ARM training for everyone, making sure that the SAORM um, designation is still within the, the current memo. All of that's been carried forward um, so that we are able to then supersede M1218. So uh, it, it's with a bit of sadness. I think Saturday was the seven-year birthday for the uh, M1218 directive. So happy birthday and see you later. Um, now we're talking about M1921. Um, and then it was just that one goal in M1218 that we were still working towards um, at the bottom of the steps, which is um, managing uh, permanent electronic records electronically. So that's something that we're still focused on until the end of this calendar year. Um, and then we start moving into some of the new targets. So Jay already mentioned the 2020 on the previous slide, and that's, that's a target that's really more for NARA, um, putting us on the hook for developing the guidance and revising our regulations to, to fully reflect um, electronic record keeping. So um, our current regs, while they've served us well for quite some time, we want to take a hard look at those and see how we can make them more modern and more current. Um, and really focus on the important things that we all need to do within the records management community that will actually help us drive um, fully electronic government. So that's something that we're going to be working on. Uh, we've already uh, issued some regs. We, we've, of course, done the digitization standards for temporary records. We're working on the same for the permanent records. And there are other things that we're currently working on um, that need to fall into alignment. Um, in addition to sort of the bigger picture of what we need to do with regs uh, for all of 36 CFR subchapter B. And then at the top 2020 um, also is a target for us to work with OPM to um, revise the position classification standards for um, the archival series and other records management information management series. So this is something that we haven't started yet that we need to engage with OPM on. We know that for the archival positions, which we probably use more in NARA than you use out within the agencies. Um, but this does extend to 308s and, and what we need to do for all of those job series to, to build in the competencies, the skills, knowledge, abilities that are needed for um, electronic records management. So this slide um, has the targets that are further out. All the uh, targets are 2022. Um, so the first one sort of builds upon 2019. 
Um, and it's a target in the memo that says federal agencies will manage all permanent records in an electronic format. So um, whereas 2019 is the born digital that just has to stay born digital or stay digital, um, this covers pretty much uh, the born digital digitized and making sure that all the records that have been identified scheduled as permanent within agencies are managed in um, electronic formats, but with appropriate metadata. So we've, 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 you'll see in this target and some of the other targets, uh, the one right above it, metadata is a key piece of um, what we're including. Um, and I know that's something that you all need in terms of you know, identifying you know, how to maintain and preserve the records um, that you have, especially the permanent records that you have. Um, and that's something that we're working on as part of guidance and regulations to make sure that we are all on the same page about what that metadata set is. So um, the next target um, talks about um, what we issued in our strategic plan in terms of NARA no longer accepting um, paper or analog records, temporary or permanent, um, but that we will only accept electronic records with the appropriate metadata. So that basically comes uh, right out of the strategic plan. It is now in the memo. So whereas I know a lot of people had told me, well, in 2018, that was in your strategic plan. Now it's in the memo and it's an administrative administration um, statement of what we want the government to work towards. 2022, the third target here um, on the blue step is one that we've had a lot of discussion about um, with agencies, and I imagine there may be some questions about that. Um, this is about closing agency-operated um, storage facilities and transferring them to commercial. So the, the thinking behind this is that um, the federal government has a number of agencies that have missions like uh, putting people on the moon, uh, finding cures for diseases. Um, those agencies with those missions do not also have a mission to store records. So the administration's um, intent is to leverage the expertise that's in the private sector and commercial storage um, expertise to do that work for us so that we can focus within our agencies on the important mission related work that we have to do. So um, the target is there, um, and as with all of these targets, it is written with the language to the fullest extent possible. There is language in the memo that does talk about exceptions, and I can talk a little bit more about that, uh, because there are going to be um, agencies and circumstances where full compliance is just not desirable or practical. And then the last target up here, 2022, federal agencies will manage all temporary records in electronic format or store them in commercial storage is really just a continuation of what we started. Here we're focusing on temporary, but really what we're trying to do is if you've got to take care of the permanent, you might as well also take care of the temporary. We really should be thinking about both holistically because what we want to do is build electronic workflows so that we are working electronically within our agencies to better support efficiency and effectiveness. So those are the targets, um, and we can talk a little bit about more of those in a bit, but right now I'm going to advance the slide, which I forgot to do before. All right. <clears throat> Turn it over to Jay. Yep, so as, um, you know, moving from uh, the mandates that Lawrence was talking about, um, you know, how do these support the, the transformation to, um, the, the digital transformation? And, um, you know, really if these kind of, have a dual purpose for the National Archives, but also for um, the executive branch. And we need to move beyond um, managing email and managing um, born digital permanent records and uh, begin to um, really look at all of the federal records, uh, again, within the executive branch. And I think for this slide, the, the key takeaways are um, within NARA, I mean, we're a small agency of uh, less than 3,000 people now, um, is that we need to set for ourselves a, a clear marker for change. Uh, the other part of it is that, um, you know, we have 
right now really trying to run dual processes between um, all of the um, textual records that we're dealing with, but also all of the uh, electronic records, um, email and others that are, are coming into us and that we need to be able to provide uh, access to today, tomorrow, and in the out years. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's really through the strategic plan for NARA and then also the uh, transition to electronic records directive. Um, it's moving beyond email, moving beyond the born digital and begin to um, again, put this clear marker out for ourselves within NARA, but also um, try to address how we um, are trying to manage the dual processes that we're under. And then I think for a really uh, much larger scope, way beyond NARA, but um, into the executive branch, is to begin to explore uh, all of the technology that's available in terms of creating electronic records, but also managing electronic records, looking, all, looking at all the technology. Um, just uh, late last night, uh, the Washington Post uh, issued an editorial on um, classified records and also controlled unclassified information um, and really is talking about the avalanche uh, of records that um, the executive branch is having to deal with um, as the government has moved away from principally textual records to um, the electronic records. Um, it has allowed the government to create a lot more records, but it has introduced a lot of challenges in, um, you know, no longer can somebody flip through pages uh, to determine whether the classification is correct or whether declassification can occur, whether it needs to stay classified. Uh, you know, we're talking about millions and millions of, of uh, information uh, today. So. So I mean, we do see that there are a lot of benefits to, to moving to fully electronic government, um, but I do want to acknowledge that there are challenges because these are the things that we all as a community need to work through. So no surprise, the first bullet up here is resources. We can all relate to that, right? Um, and I just noted that there are a couple different sort of categories of those resources. I mean, one, obviously, it's a money thing. In order to be able to do electronic government, um, really well, you need to have the tools and the technology and the infrastructure uh, to do that. Um, but I think you know, the other area which I know we're also very familiar with is, is the, the, the workforce that we have and the skills that are present within that workforce, which is a main reason why we want to work with OPM and work, about, work on competencies and skills because there's really two parts of this problem that is an issue that we need to face and really try and come up with some solutions for. One is the shallowness of it, the succession planning that we need. A lot of our, our agencies and departments don't have a lot of staff dedicated to records management, or we have to rely on liaisons and custodians to, to do the work, which there really should be a, a professional records management workforce doing um, with, at headquarters or within the agencies and departments. So there's the shallowness, but then also the skills, and we've got to make sure we put both together. Uh, and in, to be frank, it's going to be a challenge in this environment, in this budget environment, with the constraints that we're all working under, uh, to get to where we need to be. There's also the legacy records issue, and we know that, um, as, as Jay talked about, all of us are running dual processes for managing paper and for managing uh, electronic records, and we have to, to be able to address the, the legacy, the paper, uh, the analog, the non-textual or non-electronic, and, and also at the same time be able to focus on what we need to do for electronic workflow and electronic records. I already talked a little bit about the skill gaps. Um, Jay uh, sort of alluded to um, volumes and the complexity of the data and the formats that we're facing, and every year they become more and more complex. Um, but these are all things that, that we need to acknowledge, identify, and then work with our senior management to get the support to be able to move forward and make the kinds of progress that we need to see part of a strategic plan that we have for records management within agencies. So, um, I mean, that's really, you know, what it comes down to, to, to address the resources and, and overcome these obstacles. We can't do it alone. Um, and we can't do it within a silo. So 
We need to be able to work with our senior agency official for records management. We need to, to let them know what it is we need from a strategic and operational perspective to make sure that we have the resources so that we can be successful. Now, a lot of this, um, I think, comes down to how we work with others in our agencies. And, and I know when I've talked um, to other groups, one of the things I typically talk about is um, leveraging an information governance kind of approach and working with our senior officials to ensure that there is some controls and mechanisms in place that will connect us in records management to other information management disciplines like privacy, security, CUI, um, and the other professionals who are working in related disciplines. Um, it's really important that we sort of build those connections and those partnerships and then work with our senior managers to try and come, w come up with an integrated strategic plan that will take care of records management in addition to all these other information management issues and mandates. So we see the connections. We see the connections with a lot of what's going on in the data management sphere now with CDOs being placed and a lot of uh, conferences and seminars and, and frankly a lot of energy around uh, data officers and data management, but it's, it's, it's very tightly connected to what we all do every day. It's data are records too. So that is, you know, a lot of what I've heard in talking to agencies is what, what they want to do. And it's a challenge to sort of bring it all together and, and make it work for the benefit of managing records and information in an agency. But, but that is sort of the goalpost out there that we're all driving towards. So with that, I think uh, we are ready to take some questions. Um, and I think we're, we're pretty much on track. Um, so we have some time. Uh, we'll open it up. We've got one question over here and one question in the middle. And one, we got them all over the place. So we might be here for a few minutes. And again, just a reminder, please tell us who you are and what agency you're from. Um, I'm Sammy Hill from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. I'm pretty sure y'all heard my name a lot before. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go back to what are you doing to help us meet our goals again? I hear what the things you guys are trying to put in place, but it comes back to the same thing. We read the same material you put out. We, we hear you. Our concerns or help comes from within our building that we need you to talk to our seniors saying, hey, this is important. We know you make maps. We know you do publishing. We need you to help your program help you. That's where our concerns are coming from. We read the directives. We communicate the directives. But it comes back to, oh, we don't have um, funding for that. Or we don't have people for that. We need you to talk to our people and say, you will help your program or you will be consequences. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know. That, uh, you know, and I mentioned that, that is on the slide, and, and it was the last bullet point on, on challenges is senior management support, because that's how you're gonna be successful. Now, I can tell you, in September alone, I think we have about nine meetings set up already um, as a follow-up to the meeting we had here on August 1st with senior agency officials for records management. So we are more than happy to, uh, to, take, to, you know, to go out on the road and help you um, meet with senior officials, meet with other, other you know, top managers and other offices, and provide that kind of support, and be able to communicate to them what the memo requires, and see if we can't help you get some momentum and support for, for what you need to do within your program. We understand the challenges. We understand that sometimes you can't do it alone. Um, and we're here, and I'm telling you that we're here to help you. So uh, by all means, reach out to us. Um, we have Kristen in the front row and Lisa uh, sitting right in front of me. We're more than happy to, um, to, to work through some logistics. If you can get people to the table, um, we're more than happy to join you. Where are we going Hi. next? Over here. Hi. Um, Portland Wilson, DHS. I, the commercial um, facilities that you mentioned, um, is NARA planning to work with those facilities to ensure that we have the same level of security for our records 
if potentially they need to be sent there. Um, the reason why I ask is because I have personally toured one of the um, commercial facilities. And with what we do um, particularly, we need a level of security for our records that we have felt fine that uh, the National Archives have, has been able to provide. Are you planning to work with these commercial agents, commercial facilities to ensure that the level of security, the clearances, the um, both for electronic and potentially paper, because all of us can't just fully move to electronic tomorrow. Um, are you planning to work with them to make sure that that is a smooth transition for us? Um, so a little, slightly over 20 years ago, um, NARA, uh, along with um, OMB at that time, um, had revised uh, 36 CFR 1234, which puts into place for um, all federal records, whether they're um, with, within an agency, within the uh, NARA Federal Record Center program, or if they're used, um, if they're stored in the private sector. There are standards that have to be met in terms of um, physical security, um, protection from water, fire, uh, et cetera. So those standards have been in place for quite a while. Uh, another section of NARA does go out and do um, oversight of those um, organizations, whether they're um, federal agencies or the private sector or the NARA Federal Record Center program to make sure they're in compliance with 36 CFR 1234 and you can be certified. Um, so I think that's the extent of what NARA has done either with uh, other federal agencies, its own record centers, or um, private sector facilities. Wait a question in the middle. So we'll take one more question in the room and then we'll see what's on, on the chat. Good morning, this is morning. Lynette Cosby from CMS. How are you all today? I had, um, a, it, it's a couple of questions and I'm gonna be succinct with them because I was looking for a little bit more specific information and I know this is kind of um, an overview. I think you said that it was available with the SAO ARO meeting. If that, is that online um, or on YouTube that we can see it? Uh, specifically what I needed to hear about was um, ERA 2.0 and how we are going to be able to get the electronic permanent records to you since that mandate is for this year. Also when the permanent record scanning regulations would be available, do you have a timeline, an estimate or something? Um, and then also is there a, a going to be a guidance or update to guidance on appropriate metadata? Um, and then with the agency operated um, record facilities, what is the exception um, or is there an exception and how, because it was skipped over in the memo, how, how can we talk about that? Thank you. So I should have brought a pen and paper up here with me. I think those are all yours, but I'll try to help yeah. you. Uh, all right, so you might have to, you might have to prompt me. Um, so the first question was, uh, the, the SAARM meeting, right? So um, we did the meeting in the room and we just did uh, audio call in for the meeting, so there's no recording of it. Um, we do have slides, which will look very much like the slides you just saw, um, which we're happy to share. Um, if you just email uh, ARM Communications, we can share the slides. Um, okay, so what was the second question? All right, 2.0. All right, okay, good question. Um, and we should make a note that we should have the folks from the ERA program uh, perhaps come back in October and talk about what we're doing with ERA. Um, I know there's a lot of development going on, um, work internally, and um, uh, I believe we're still on schedule for um, uh, 2020, sometime in 2020, um, having the new business objects, the, the record schedule and the, and the transfer requests available for piloting and use uh, within agencies. So uh, we will take that back and make sure that we get um, a good briefing on ERO, ERA um, in October. And then, okay. so, so just to pick on that, are yep. we able to send the electronic records through ERA now currently with 1.0? 
Um, not directly into the system. That's part of you know what ERA 2.0 is founded on is that it's a cloud-based system that will allow that functionality. So that's what we are currently in development and refinement. Okay, permanent record scanning regulations. Yeah, so something that we are working on and have been working on for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, with regulations, it's always hard to do timeline because uh, the review periods are um, sometimes challenging. We have interagency review, we have OMB review, um, and it's hard for us to put clocks and deadlines on those kinds of things. But we are still hopeful that we'll have it out um, because we have a draft um, within the next couple months. Um, out for interagency review. Right, out for interagency review within the next couple of months. Um, and that sort of gets to your next question about metadata. Yeah, appropriate metadata. Appropriate metadata is included as part of that rule. Okay. And then I know you had one more. The last one was the agency, what's the exception for exceptions. the agency operated record centers? Right, so um, exceptions in general, uh, which are in that section at the end of 2.1 of the memo, which is also referred to as section 2.2, which is not actually in the memo. Um, there are roughly four categories where it describes um, where agencies can request an exception, which is cost exceeding the benefit, um, burden on the public, uh, statutory or regulatory provisions, such as you know, a law or statute requiring an ink signature, um, and policy barriers, which you know, we would refer to you know, our policies or agency um, policies that may not be in a statute or regulation, but um, for example, like we have a policy within the National Archives called NAR 1441, which is our appraisal policy, which talks about intrinsic value of certain paper records, which um, we're going to have conversations with agencies, and I'm sure hear from agencies about certain records that we believe or agree have intrinsic value, which we will want the analog version. So those are generally the four categories. We are working on a communication out to all of you, which we hope will be out within a month. Um, and I'm gonna be optimistic. Um, that will talk not only in a little bit more detail about each of those four categories, but also provide some information about how you need to communicate with us about your need. Now, one thing I can tell you is there's really no need for you to, to wait for that. Uh, it will be coming soon. But what I encourage you all to do is look at your series of records, look at your systems, look at the memo, see where you think you might need an exception because it fits into one of those four categories, and then start doing uh, some of the analysis justification that you are eventually going to need to communicate to us so that we can review your request for an exception within NARA and with OMB. So we're gonna need that information. One thing that we have been telling agencies and encouraging agencies to do is um, try and develop to the best extent possible, and I'll repeat that, to the best extent possible, um, a comprehensive request for all the various things that you might need that would fall under that provision within the memo. Um, that will allow you to get it to us sooner once we issue the, the communication to agencies. Um, and will allow us to review it uh, more expeditiously. Uh, so let's go to the chat. So this first one's from the USDA Forest Service. What is the current progression as it deals with NARA and OPM working the issue of EMFs and the EOPFs? That's timely. Um, I don't. I really don't have uh, a progress report on that. I mean, we have clearly um, identified that as one of the issues for um, personnel records, um, specifically those that um, have been retired to the National Personnel Records Center. Um, so we are clearly aware of that as an issue, but I don't have a progress report. And another question is a, sort of a broader question. How many agencies are working towards implementing a true e-record system? Thank you. 
I would hope it, it's all of them. <laughs> I mean, there is that, that 2019 goal, and I know what agencies have been focusing on, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, is first you got to identify inventory, schedule all those permanent records, but then that work has to lead into sort of the electronic management of, of those records per M1218 and now M1921. So um, if you're not, and you're asking that question because you're not, then get in touch with us and we'll see if we can't point you to some resources. And there have been a couple questions about the exceptions process, but I think we've covered those. Yes, we will have something more. Um, why don't we, we'll take uh, one more, or no, we'll do two more, because we got one here and we got one over here. And then, again, if you have questions, um, because I want to make sure we have time for the rest of the agenda. I will be back at 1 o'clock in the afternoon up in the Washington Conference Room if you want to stop by, or you can always uh, email us at rmcommunications at narrow.gov. All right. P again, I just want to follow up to that, that question about the agency with the, the full ERM system. Who has almost a 90% solution? It should see due to the reports, who? So I, I don't want to put any agencies on the spot, and I think a good way to, to really see where agencies are, especially on that 2019 goal and going fully electronic, is to look at some of the reporting data that we have posted up on our website. Don will talk about it a little bit later, but we have all the SAORM reports that agencies have submitted for 2018, and there's a very specific question about progress on 2019. For the responses of those to that question, which is usually a narrative response, there's um, there's a lot of good information there that can be mined and will allow you to follow up with agencies that look like they're uh, ahead of the game or where they need to be. So we'll do one more question. I think we have one. Oh, we have. Okay, we'll do one here and then we'll. I noticed that goal 1.2 includes metadata, but 1.1 does not. Does that mean records transferred to NAR before 12, 31, 22 do not need to have metadata? Uh, no, I wouldn't assume that. Um, and it's not really necessary for it to be there in the memo because it's in the regs. If you are transferring records, permanent records to the National Archives, there's already requirements for metadata that need to be transferred along with, with the records. It's sort of there in the memo to, to just sort of hammer it home. But I mean, obviously, I think, you know, we all need the metadata to manage the records within our agencies. We're gonna need the metadata to manage the records for access once we take legal custody so that we can provide them to the public and our customers. So uh, I wouldn't assume that that would be the case. Okay. so. Um, Thank you for your questions. We look forward to hearing from you. If you have any other questions, one of the things that I told the senior agency officials uh, at the meeting on August 1st is that we are really focusing right now on collecting your questions, trying to develop an FAQ that we can send out to all of you that further clarifies some of the, the points and um, targets that are in M1921. Um, so we are working uh, not only on the regs, um, in the digitization regs, but also in FAQs and trying to, to get that information out to you. So your questions, your concerns are very helpful to us as we continue the development of those FAQs. So thank you. Um, I appreciate the questions and, and your time. And I will now transition after I thank Jay Trainer yep, for you. joining GSA. Um, to, um, to Matt and Bob who are here um, to, from GSA to talk about some of the things that they're doing that are uh, also supporting the work that uh, we are doing with M1921. So uh, with that, I will flip the slide and invite Matt and Bob up here. Or which microphone to use here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to NARA for including us. Uh, we're really excited to be a part of the discussion. And uh, in 
supporting M1921 and how GSA and Schedule 36 can help support that. So um, I'll be talking about our solution, uh, how we've been working with NARA to, um, to build this solution and again to help support M1921. And we'll discuss recent and ongoing changes to, to the solution and uh, again, how we can help. So hopefully everyone has uh, a general idea of what the schedules program is. Um, but just to make sure, well, I'll give a, a quick run through of that. Uh, so you've probably heard the schedules program referred to in, in several different ways, multiple award schedules, MAS, federal supply schedules, FSS, uh, GSA schedules, or just schedules. So uh, I know that causes some confusion. It did for me earlier, early in my career at DOD. Um, but, you know, I'll be referring to it as schedules, and I think that's probably the most common name. So uh, these are, are government-wide contracts. It, it's really a collection of contracts that provide products and services. Uh, there are multiple award IDIQs with a five-year base period and three five-year options. GSA negotiates the pricing up front. Um, those are ceiling prices, and at the order level, you would expect additional discounting. And we work with, uh, we work to pre-qualify vendors to make sure they have good performance prior to getting on contract, uh, that they have the financial capabilities to manage uh, large orders. Uh, we also, you know, the contracts provides uh, access to small businesses in support of your socioeconomic goals. Um, one important thing to mention, there are currently 24 schedules uh, that represent various different categories uh, of purchasing uh, products and services. However, that will soon change. Uh, we're combining all of those schedules into a single schedule. Um, I'll get to that at a, a later slide, but uh, the point there is to help customers, make it easier for vendors, and we think it will achieve that. So. I talked about those 24 schedules soon to become one, uh, but currently Schedule 36 is one of those uh, 24 schedules. Um, NARA approached GSA a few years back uh, about records management solutions, looking for a contract that they could endorse and share with customers uh, as a way to support their records management requirements. Uh, so at that time, we had a, a single SIN, and, and I should mention that, that there is and has been some crossover uh, with records management over the different schedules. Uh, we have an IT schedule, professional services schedule, but Schedule 36 is really where records management has always been housed. Um, so that uh, initial structure was a, a single special item number, as we call it. Um, it really, it's a subcategory of Schedule 36, and that subcategory was titled Records Management Services. Um, in speaking with NARA, we realized that it would probably benefit uh, you as records officers and contracting officers to, to separate um, out physical records management and electronic records management. So that's what we did. We think it, it highlights the vendor pools for each category and, and brings some specificity to the offerings. So for physical records management solutions, uh, which is basically your storage and retrieval of physical records, we have uh, currently have 75 contractors. Um, and for ERM, we have 50 vendors awarded. And again, this, this process started um, a little over two, two years ago. So we've really onboarded, onboarded these vendors very quickly. Uh, one important thing to mention here is that we've incorporated the universal electronic records management standards into uh, the ERM subcategory, uh, which is really important and ensures that, that you're compliant with those regulations when you're using the, this contract. Um, and you know, as, those, as NARA updates those requirements, we will also incorporate those changes into the contracts. So uh, another thing we've done here is um, we're requiring vendors to self-certify 
Uh, you see the, the 11 elements of electronic records management services. So our vendors, um, when they submit an offer to, to get onto Schedule 36, they're certifying to each of those elements and the standards associated with those elements that, they can, that they're capable of performing those services and, and complying with those requirements. Um, all of those, <clears throat> excuse me, all of those certifications are available on GSA's website, GSA eLibrary, and they're also available on a new tool that we developed for market research purposes that Matt will, will do a quick run through of called the GSA Discovery Tool. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to find the solutions, find the vendors capable of, of performing um, under the elements that, that are incorporated into your requirements. Okay, so t total solutions for records management. So um, customers, records officers, uh, contracting officers can use multiple records management categories under Schedule 36 in order to achieve a total solution. So um, as, as you all know, an ERM solution can um, can cover a wide array of services. It, it can be uh, ERM, physical records management, and, and we're trying to allow for that uh, with a single contract instead of issuing separate contracts for each individual service. So, um, so these are just different subcategories. So SIN 51501 provides needs assessment analysis services. One feedback, uh, a lot of feedback that we've gotten from the vendor community and industry is that this is something that's lacking in, in both government and commercial uh, industry, that, you know, that customers really need to do that needs assessment up front to make sure that they're getting a solution that works for them. Uh, they're finding that often, oftentimes uh, we're backing into solutions and ultimately ending up with something that really doesn't fit an agency's uh, core requirements. So uh, that's, that's definitely an important thing to note. Um, we also have SIN 51506, Document Conversion Services, which is essentially dig digitization. And, and I would say this is, you know, in a, a very literal sense, uh, supporting M1921, you know, trans transforming into an electronic and digital government. Um, so scanning those files, scanning those permanent records, um, and getting those into an electronic format. Uh, we also have destruction services for uh, shredding and, and hard drive destruction for, for those documents that, uh, that you don't need to put in storage. Um, and then, of course, we have electronic records management and physical records management, we've, which we've talked about. Again, uh, transferring temporary records into commercial storage facilities. That's where this SIN 51504 would come in. And again, just you know, being able to use all of these together uh, to provide a total solution and you know, in, in one, a single contract. So I know this is something that, that you know, probably your, your contracting officers need to hear as well, and, and we're happy to, to have those discussions um, you know, at your convenience. Um, and I talked about combining all of these into to one. GSA eBuy is GSA's solicitation tool that allows for that and is uh, probably the easiest way to solicit quotes under these solutions. Uh, and our team, again, can provide training on any of the GSA tools, GSA eBuy, eLibrary, uh, the discovery tool, which Matt will demo, and any other, any other GSA tools available to you. So again, I talked about that MAS consolidation, and I think it's important to, to touch on this briefly. You know, we're talking about Schedule 36, Schedule 36, and, and then you know, it's going to disappear. So um, the goals of that consolidation, again, uh, are to make it easier for customers to find these solutions under a single contract vehicle. We're consolidating 24 schedules into one, and that's expected to go into effect in FY 2020. And how this will affect records management, um, Schedule 36, again, is, is being consolidated. You won't see the, the SIN numbers, but there will be uh, a subcategory or some identifier that, that calls out records management, electronic records management, um, digitization. Um, so that's important. And, uh, you know, but for essentially for RM, 
it, it's not a material change. It's, it's really just a reformatting. You may find it in a different area, but it, it's, it's all still going to be there. Now, uh, one thing we also wanted to touch on is uh, that we, after a long process we, and working with NARA, we were able to uh, get approval for product and service codes for records management. Uh, they do line up with our subcategories for physical records management and ERM. And what, what, how this can help you is um, it, it really will allow you to track and report agency spend data that you can share with management. It will show you what vendors you're, you're um, awarding to. It also helps NARA to track who is making progress towards M1921, um, what their spend is for records. So, and, and it also helps GSA in, uh, again, tracking what vendors are being awarded. Do we have those vendors under our solution? Um, because what, in those instances where we don't, we want to add those to make sure they're available to you. So again, uh, this may not be, um, you know, hopefully it's relative to you, but it's also important for your contractors to know as well. Um, they'll be loading the, the uh, PSC in FPVS, uh, which is how it eventually gets to all of us. And then lastly, before I turn it over to Matt, um, M1921 mentions the President's Management Agenda and the cross-agency priority goals. And, uh, you know, one of those cap goals is increasing the adoption of Schedule 36 for electronic records management. So I think that uh, provides an additional incentive. All agencies are required to adopt at least one of the goals under the cap program. So by using ERM under Schedule 36, you're, you're kind of checking that box. But, you know, we're not here really to, to get you to check a box. We, we truly think that this is a solution that, that can help you meet the directives in M1921. Um, you know, we're working on a regular basis with NARA. We have biweekly calls. Uh, we're attending conferences. Um, so we're really working hard to improve the solution, to get it where it needs to be. Um, to help you with those directives, but we also want your feedback. You know, what can we do to, imp to continue that improvement? Um, how can we help you? And again, if, if that's um, getting in front of your contracting shop or, or meeting with uh, your senior leadership, we're happy to do that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt for a, a quick demo of our new market research tool. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Mastronardo. I work at GSA with Bob. I'm a contract specialist on the Schedule 36 team. And I'm here to talk about the Discovery Tool, which is a new development under our Schedule 36 uh, program. Um, as you can see, there's the website, discovery.gsa.gov. And uh, so what, what I'm going to do really quickly is just do a brief overview of the Discovery Tool, talk about its benefits, a little comparison of uh, what we were doing beforehand and how this is a lot easier and saves you a lot of time to get you the vendor information that you need to meet your ERM or records management requirements. So, a little overview. Um, it, the, the discovery tool is really a, a market research tool. That's how we're using it. Um, it's, by, and by market research, I, I don't mean price comparisons or pricing data, it's really um, to find the, at the beginning of your acquisition stage or at your acquisition process to find which vendors have the capabilities that meet your requirements. So this will do this in a faster way for you. Um, you can filter by the 11 narrow universal ERM requirements and coming soon you're going to have video demos from vendors who submit them of uh, different ERM use cases. So that enables you to basically have the vendor give you an idea of their specific approach to ERM solutions. Also on the discovery tool, you can view uh, vendors' work performance history, and you can look at the dollar value, which agencies they've, they've worked for, um, the date. You can, you can uh, filter by NAICS codes, and like what Bob was just mentioning, PSC codes. All right. So before Discovery Tool, 
this is what we were kind of working with. This is a screenshot of GSA eLibrary. And I took this last week. There was 50 contractors on, on our ERM SIN, 51600. Each of these contractors has, if you see all the way on the right side, a little text file. It's a PDF document in most cases. Sometimes they're 150 pages long with all the pricing and terms and conditions. But there's the missing pieces really just like a high level overview of the services that they provide for electronic records management. So uh, although we do have the self-certification ERM page showing which of the ER ERM elements they self-certify that they meet, uh, that's in one of the 150 pages. So that just, nobody wants to scroll 150 pages and it can take a lot of time. And imagine doing that for 50 contracts. So that's where we were before. This is where we're going. This is the discovery tool. And as you can see, ERM is at the bottom right. You can get to the vendor information in a couple different ways. If you see in the middle of the page, there's a search bar. You can search by NAICS code, the new PSC codes, when we have that up there, and uh, keywords. The keywords would be electronic records management, ERM, or any of the 11 um, records, uh, records management categories, um, or the, the 11 universal ERM elements. You can also just click right on the ERM link, and that will take you to the landing page. I don't have the screenshot of the landing page, but this is at the bottom of the landing page. These are the 11 ERM record types. If you click on each of these, you're gonna filter down to which of our 50 vendors, currently 50 vendors, um, applies to that or self-certify that they meet those standards. Um, so for example, desktop applications, right? If you click on that, you're gonna get all the desktop application vendors. You can also filter by multiple records types, right? So if you're need, need you have desktop, desktop applications, cloud services, electronic messages, social media, you can then filter which of the vendors meet all of those requirements instead of, again, viewing 150 page text files. Um, once you get your filtered vendor list, you can then click on each of the, the names and then get their, um, their contract info and their company info. You can also see uh, this sorts by the number of contract actions. So IBM um, has 1,600 contract actions, right? Um, here is the vendor details page. Once you click on that, that link, um, you can view their contract history, uh, like things I said with their past performance, their contract value, the date, which agency they worked with and their basic company info, as well as their small business or socioeconomic um, indicators. Coming soon, we'll have, if you see that highlighted right there, the link to the vendor's video demos, which I think, in my, in my opinion, that's gonna be the most important piece and the most important gap that this will fill that the GSA eLibrary website really doesn't have. Um, again, this is for vendors to show you their approach to the ERM use cases. And we're ready for those for those videos. The the vendors are gonna, you know, they have to do that at their own time. They all have different restraints and different budgets and everything. But whenever we get those video demos, now we're and, and GSA are ready to make them approve them, check them, and put them up on the, on this website. Right now, the use cases I would just want to mention, right now the use cases are limited to electronic messages. We're kind of doing rolling these out one at a time. Um, and these are the three specific use cases for electronic, rec uh, electronic messages that vendors can submit videos for right now. And we hope more use cases will be coming soon. So that was a little bit about the discovery tool and how it can quickly get you the information that you need when you're looking for vendors uh, to, to, to meet your solutions that, that, that you need for records management. Um, this is the, the typical uh, questions for, um, or yeah, you can, I'm sorry, you can chat via YouTube, but I wanna point out this email, that's GSA email, okay? That's for not submitting questions today. Right here, that's for, if you have questions at the end of the day, tomorrow, whenever, that's Bob, Bob and I basically monitor that email and we're happy to jump on the phone with you, have a discussion with you with any, of, any questions you have about records management or schedule 36.
we can open it up for questions on the floor right now. <laughs> or we'll sit down and I'll just get right back up. <laughs> Matthew Hebert, uh, Department of Justice, OIG. Uh, is there anything on discovery that uh, discusses classification levels? So if you had, you know, high side stuff you wanted to digitize or store, does it make any distinctions about which vendors are capable of that or pricing? Right now, it's really only for the universal ERM requirements. But there were, we're definitely looking for feedback for more information. If it's possible to provide more information, this is the, the platform that we want to get it on. Okay. So again, if you have any ideas like that, please feel free to email us at the records management at gsa.gov and let us know. And that's something we can work with our, our uh, discovery tool team to see if we can get it up there for you. Great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Amanda Payone from the Executive Office of the President. And um, we're actually in a market research swing right now. One of the things that we're looking for is whether or not there's ever contacts from other agencies that have used these services before so that we can get one-on-one -on -one information on how those vendors work for that agency. Yes, yeah, so um, that's a good question. And again, it, it is a, a fairly new solution. Uh, but we do have, so to answer your first question, yes, we have worked with some agencies. Um, we've reviewed their uh, requirements documents, the PWS, RFQ. Again, that's something we can help um, if you do have questions with that. Um, so I, I, I could talk to you maybe offline and just about some of uh, who those agencies were. I will say um, many of them actually all of them are still out on the street with an RFQ or they're, they have quotes in-house that they're reviewing. Um, but I could talk to, to you a little bit about kind of where they're at, um, what they did pre-solicitation and, and share some of that information. Yeah. Any questions online, Irene? No, okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Oops. Oh, one back one. All right. Good afternoon. Actually, good morning. Uh, I'm Don Rosa. I'm the Director of Records Management Oversight and Reporting. Uh, and I want to do this morning is to give you a little bit of an update of where we are with the annual reporting results from this past year. Uh, I was here the last time. I think we were close to being done. And I just wanted to give you a status of where we are. Um, so everyone knows reporting ran from uh, March through April. We, had, we started late because of the shutdown. Um, but I think we're close to being back on track in terms of uh, getting everything finalized. Uh, we had ended up having about 95% response rate, which was uh, fantastic. So thank you to everyone who participated uh, in reporting this year. So it was great. Uh, and all the reports um, are now um, online in terms of the SCR reports and the email management reports. So you can find them there. And we're now finalizing um, the farm report. Um, we hope to have that out soon. Right now it's going through management review uh, and then we send it to OMB and once that's finalized we'll have it out. But I'd like to do today is give you a little bit of a sneak preview to where we are um, with that. So again, for those who don't know, the RMSA, it's records management self-assessment where you provide us all the feedback reports and the email management report. So let's take that. Again, those are the links to where you'd find their reports. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, lots of good information there on both. A couple things I did want to point out, as Lawrence uh, mentioned, there's a lot of good stuff in the SCR reports, including uh, things that people are doing. I think there are about 95% said they're on target to meet those SCR reports. So go ahead and take a look there. Email management reporting, 
where we are there. Uh, we had good results uh, for the SCR reports, email management. Um, about 68% uh, said they are on target to meet the goals there, so that was really good. We were happy with that as well. Um, excuse me. Uh, RMSA, uh, we had 51% uh, responded that they were uh, on target uh, so to meeting the goals as well. So we are in terms of those in high risk, low risk, and moderate risk. So doing well there. We were pleased with the results. Uh, things have been staying uh, pretty much on target as we have in past years. As you can see, the results from 2014 through uh, 2018. So we've been actually trending in the right, right direction, and we appreciate uh, things that we've been seeing there. So that's been really good. Uh, and we'll go dive more into that as we move forward. One of the things that uh, we wanted to share was what we are seeing from staff development and information systems. These were the areas that we saw uh, people expressing what things that they were doing. Uh, as you can see here, all the various levels that you were showing that you were working on. We saw good results in acceptance process, a lot of agencies doing requirements, so that's good to see. The design phase, development phase, so all these different areas that you are showing that you are working in. So that was really good. We we're happy with that. A lot of progress being made. One of the questions I heard earlier was, where would you find um, who was working on these types of systems? Basically, everybody is. Uh, results, I think we said something like almost 95% said they were in some level of working on doing some type of electronic records management system. So if you want to see what they're doing, look at those SRA reports, participate in these working groups because everyone is doing something. And what the good news here is, is that you're all being asked to be involved. And this is something we're looking to see progress on. Um, if you back a few years, not every time the records officer was involved, but now we know that they are, um, especially when it comes to requirements gathering. Again, here's 74%. You know, the big thing here is making sure that someone has, uh, are they in the room? Are they getting access to the right people? Um, so that's good. Also being involved, not only the design phase, but uh, implementation and all the way through the process. So we, uh, we are happy with that. Um, and there is more information to share in the, um, in the reports as well moving forward. Um, another area we also saw was that you were doing more participation um, with the, uh, Schedule 36, as was just demoed before. We saw, I think, majority of the agencies were familiar with it, which was good for us. So we were happy with that as well. Another thing that we wanted to look at this year, we asked you about, were the challenges to managing uh, electronic records, records and metadata? And these were the areas that you cited where you had the most challenges. It's actually, as you can see, a little bit all over the place, right? Um, communication tools and email continue to be the predominant issues where we're seeing those challenges, about 34% overall. And then everything else, a little bit of different flavors, administrative functions, mission areas. So a variation of where we're finding those challenges. Um, metadata was another one as well. Um, so hopefully this information kind of points to where what we're seeing those issues are and uh, our guidance is out there to help as well. So what are we doing next? We need to finalize this report. Um, as I mentioned when I started, uh, we need to finish uh, the farm report and that's going to be similar to what you've seen in the past. It will have the high level results from the SEO reporting, uh, what we saw, how you're meeting that 2019 deadline. And I should point out, if I didn't mention we started, uh, close to 90% of you said, yes, you're on target to meet that goal. So uh, come 2019, December 31st, 2019, uh, hopefully everyone is on target. And uh, when you mentioned that, that you, are, you are ready to meet that goal. Um, and then uh, we are going to uh, publish once we get clearance. It'll be up on our website, the complete farm report. You'll also see all the detailed information from the email maturity model and as well as the um, RMSA. And I can come back in October and take us a deeper dive into all that information. And the other thing we're doing is we're uh, planning for 2019. Uh, the big thing that we're going to have to do is uh, plan for uh, how, take a deeper dive into how you met that 2019 goal. So we're developing a maturity model for that. Uh, we're going to hopefully get that finalized soon. Similar to the email maturity model, we're going to do one for the permanent records, electronic permanent records. Uh, 
hopefully we have some clearance on that back in, hopefully in October, and I'll talk about that and start to share that around. So when we kick this off in January of 2020, everyone is ready and familiar with what we're going to be reporting on. Um, I know it'll probably feel like a quick turnaround since we just finished reporting, but we do need to pivot uh, towards 2019, and that's where our efforts are right now. Um, and hopefully we'll start sometime in early January and for uh, the next year's reporting cycle. Uh, and again, I'll have more information. We'll have those templates out. Um, Cindy Smolovic and her team will be sharing information like they've done in the past. We plan to use the same tool, Qualtrics, as we have for the last several years, and we'll be moving forward with that. So, so that's where we stand with reporting right now. Um, happy to answer any questions about uh, this year's report or what we're pivoting towards for uh, next year. Questions? Anything? Yes. Can I go back? Will this allow me to go back, Lisa? Um, first one. There we go. Yeah, and I encourage you to go to um, the SEO reports uh, if you're looking to see what agencies are doing. We have almost 100 of them up there. Um, you know, from large agencies to micro agencies. Uh, basically, it's the templates that you filled out explaining how you're meeting those goals, what you're doing with digitization, what you're doing with ERM. Some people list some of the products they're working with. So it's, it's a good resource uh, to see what, what others are doing. Um, and the email management reports are really useful as well. Uh, you could sort of get a sense of how agencies are meeting that challenge in terms of where they rank on that maturity model spectrum. Other questions? OK, well, if you have any additional questions, contact me, um, Cindy, or you can send them to the RM self-assessment mailbox, and we'll be happy to uh, uh, take you uh, answer any questions. All right, thank you. OK, so. This was intentional. We put training last because we know everybody wants to talk about training. So we figure if we put it at last on the agenda, no one will try and make an early exit to go to lunch <laughs> because everyone is going to have training questions, right? So I know you're writing them down now. You're getting them queued up. Um, and we have some good content um, and um, some introductions that we're going to do. But before uh, I turn it over to Gary, um, to uh, kick off our training segment. Um, I do have an announcement to share. Um, I know many of you have worked with Gary Ralphus over the years, our Director of Records Management Training, and um, it's my sad duty, for me, not for Gary, to announce his uh, imminent departure from NARA. Um, he will be transitioning sometime in September, we believe, um, to the Department of Homeland Security. Um, where he will continue his uh, career in uh, developing, delivering training. So uh, it's a big loss for us here at the National Archives. Um, Gary's done uh, an outstanding job um, transitioning our program to where we are right now, which is um, developing and delivering records management content to all of you online. We know that's where we need to be. Um, and Gary has um, really led the way, um, having the knowledge on how to design um, and develop a curriculum for uh, virtual online coursework. Um, and he's done a great job working with his staff and his team in getting them uh, staffed up, skilled, and prepared to meet the challenge. Now, um, just because Gary is leaving doesn't mean we're done. Um, we still have a lot of work to do and a lot of content to develop and refine. Um, and they're going to talk a lot about uh, what we're doing now and what we're going to have available for you in the training program. Um, and um, he will also be introducing uh, Michelle and Jill. Um, I also wanted to, uh, before I turn it over to Gary, to thank Michelle, who you'll hear from later today for stepping in um, as acting Gary um, after Gary transitions away. 
Um, so uh, unfortunately, Michelle, you're going to be the ones getting the questions. So, but Michelle's Michelle's up for it. We we had a little chat yesterday. She's ready to go and continue the good work that we have done in the training program um, and working with all of you on your records management training needs. So. With that, I will shut up and turn it over to Gary to kick off our training segment. Well, thank you all. And um, woo, wow. can you bring the slides back up? We'll go to the, um, we'll be going to the website at the end of this. Perfect, thank you. Um, and before I forget, I just want to thank all of you for my last five years working with many of you. It's been an absolute pleasure to try to meet your needs at the same time really looking at hard work to modernize our program. And none of that could have been done without our team at NARA and your help. And so I'm glad we were able to have Jill come in today, who behind all of this for four years has been cracking the whip on all of us in our program as our, pro as our project manager for this curriculum redesign. Um, and it's been quite a feat for us to try to keep the current program going to deliver the current certificate training at the same time that we've been building this entire new thing. And to keep those going side by side has been quite the challenge and Jill has kept us on track. Um, occasionally reminding us that, hey, I really am not so worried that you're scheduled to teach the next two weeks straight. You still owe me this product so that we don't mess up this other thing going on, right? So thanks, Jill, for your work. Um, and I'm really looking forward to turning things over to Michelle. Um, knowing that she'll be able to carry this work forward and take the program to wherever the future is beyond my time at NARA. So with that, we've got a couple of topics that to we want to introduce. We've, um, we've talked about the things we're going to roll out for several months now in October. So this is going to get a little bit more into that detail. Um, so I'm going to hand the, the mic off to Jill, who will talk about uh, Remis, our records management instruction support. And then Michelle's going to come up handle the Agency Records Officer Credential, or AROC, and then I'm going to close it out with a little demonstration of the web catalog. All that stuff that we've been building is almost completely at your fingertips now. We've got about half of it up online. We'll walk through some of it, and the remainder should be on our website by the, by the end of the calendar year. So great work that our team has done. Glad that we get to share it to you with you today. So Jill, take it away. Hello, everybody. How you doing? You guys excited? Records management. Woohoo! Right? <laughs> All right. So uh, I am going to talk to you about Remiss. Uh, I first off want to talk about sort of provide some context around this, um, which I know you all have seen this a million times. But um, part of this you know, comes from the fact that CFR says that you know agencies are responsible for providing uh, guidance and training to, to to all staff about records management, right? And then the second part is is this part here, which we've heard a lot about today, about M1921, which basically says again that agencies are re required annually to inform personnel of their records management responsibilities. Um, so that's the context around this. And what we're going to do today is, again, to talk to you about what are some things that we're putting in place to help you, to help agencies do this, to help you train your staff. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is remiss. And Gary kind of let the cat out of the bag already, but what is remiss? And I always say, well, I would be remiss to not tell you what remiss is. We just get a kick out of ourselves, I guess. Uh, but re REMIS stands for, like Gary said, Records Management Instruction Support. We were calling ourselves training advising at first, but then we thought we would call ourselves something a little bit more catchy. So hopefully you will not forget. So what are some of the things that are part of REMIS that are going to make up this initiative that we're going to um, moving forward? Uh, one is a contact desk, which basically is an email box, which is basically me. So I am the contact, uh, contact desk before you, uh, with the help of my colleagues working on this as well. So what REMIS is really here to do is to provide supports and resources to help you train staff around records management. Uh, so first you would contact, you could contact me at this help desk. Um, also through this, what, this is a lot of words here, but assessment, design, development, and implementation consulting, which basically is, say you wanted to design and develop some training for staff, uh, and you wanted the tools to kind of understand uh, how you do lesson design and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and storyboarding and those types of things. So we have some tools and templates and resources that will be available to you um, to help you do that. 
also training kit consulting, which when we started talking about this, we started thinking about uh, sort of like the those like food kit ideas, right? We kept joking about that, a like blue apron or those types of things. Uh, but this is basically you would come and you could say, you know, say for example, I want to train my staff in how to manage email, or and I want to train my staff in how to manage a share drive, or whatever the topic is going to be. You would contact us, and we could look at the tools and resources that we have available. And Gary's going to talk a lot about some of those things are, are going to be available on the web. But part of this is us kind of looking at what we have avail available to sort of help you figure out how those pieces can come together to be a course to, to train and to, to, to help staff. And then the last part of this is, is really sort of train the trainer supports and services. Again, so, and I'm going to talk about the scope of these things in a minute, um, but this could be something like, for example, I'm in Boston, for example. Well, I'm not in Boston, I'm in Washington, D.C., but normally I'm housed in the Boston area. Um, but you would contact me and say, for example, you were going to be training your staff and you wanted me to call in and sit in and provide some feedback, um, those types of things. And then we also have some other sort of tips and, and tricks and that kind of stuff that we can give to you to sort of help you in terms of providing training. Um, so those are the kind of the big things um, that we're thinking that this remiss project or initiative is what we're calling it will include. And then sort of what are the scopes? This is really small scale projects. I just kind of want to put this out there now. There's, good, there's no formal agreements around this. Literally, you're going to contact me and say, hey, you know, I need some help around this, or I want to train my staff in that. What, what can NARA do to help me? So that's what this is really about. This is a free service. It's free for you. Uh, and then the other thing it, it says here is it's really for local travel only. So let me so to be clear. I say I'm the, I'm the contact desk, um, but I have colleagues in other parts of the country as well. So say for example, uh, you were in another part of the country, or you, you were wanting to train folks in another part of the country, uh, and I had a colleague there that could travel within 50 miles, they could go to sort of to help. Um, but uh, normally it would just be that uh, if, if there wasn't someone within 50 mile range, it would be a remote access and remote service to, for people. Um, and I guess that's it for remiss, and I'm going to pass you off to Michelle now um, to, talk, to talk to you about AROC, and we will handle all questions at the end about the records management training initiatives. And I know I'm a fast talker, and I mumble, so hopefully I didn't do that today. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them later. That's it. Okay. All right. What is AROC? That's, yeah, something like that, right? Okay. So, and Gary let the cat out of the bag with this one as well. <laughs> okay, so I know that Gary's been uh, talking at Bridge uh, for probably several months, longer than that now, about a new, um, our new certificate, right? That everyone here is familiar with our Certificate of Federal Records Management Training, the KA series, right? And that that would be going away and that we'd be replacing it with something. Well, here is the preview. We're replacing it with the agency records officer credential. So uh, this, the KA series will be retiring here at the end of the FY. And we are replacing it with the AROC. And this will be 100% um, virtual online. So no more of the nine day in class sessions. And uh, this, however, a major change from the, the certificate to the credential is that it is only for agency designated records officers. So that's an important distinction to make. Uh, if you are a current ARO and you have our certificate, you will be grandfathered into this process. So that's, that's something else to consider. Renewals will also happen with this process. So before, with our certificate, you took the certificate and it was good for life, right? Now the new AROC credential will have a renewal process. It will start, as you can see up on the screen, in January of 2023, and it will be renewed every three years. The renewal will take place online. It'll have an online test. Uh, for anyone who doesn't pass the test or just, you know, fails with, the, with a certain, in certain areas, you'll have to take that training and then retest. And then also for new records officers that are coming on board that don't have our certificate currently, uh, we will have a training uh, program in place where you'll be assigned a coach from our training staff 
and they will guide you through the training and the testing. Okay, I think that's it. I think I haven't missed anything. Then just so you know, the next, I know the next question, right, is when are we gonna get the specific details? How's this gonna be implemented, right? Well, we have a bulletin ready to come out. I understand that it's met all the wickets here internally within NARA. And it will be, I think it's at OMB right now, and it should come out before the start of the new FY. So that bulletin will have all the specifics and how the new credential is going to be implemented. We're also developing an FAQ list uh, with some more specifics. All right, I'm also from Boston, so I talk really fast, sort of like Jill. So if I went through that a little bit too fast, you know, feel free. We're going to be here for questions at the end. And now I'm going to hand it over to the star of this show, Gary, because he's got some awesome stuff to show you. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. And now if we can switch over to the, uh, to the website, that'll be great. And hopefully I get to drive. Awesome. This is working great. Um, so I'm going to drive a little bit with a, a live demo and see what risks Sky entail trying to do that in front of you all today. Um, but we are literally will be looking at what's the, here today for y'all to do training now. And it'll also give you a little more detail on what does this curriculum look like that will comprise the credential. So if you come to archives.gov and we go the easy route, look at records managers, on our records management homepage, um, you'll find our training and education section. Uh, by the way, right next to the oversight and reporting, so if you didn't get those email addresses or the web addresses Don had, this is another great way to find all those oversight reports. It's, it's right there for you. We've redone our front page. So you've seen a little bit of these areas before. As our program is transformed, these are kind of our five, five work areas with training materials, our catalog, building stuff going forward, webinars. As Jill said, remiss. And again, these are just brief descriptions for new folks. And then last our agency records officer credential. And we will be building out some subsequent pages for some of these other areas, particularly the credential that we'll get up on the website. But today we're primarily gonna look at the catalog. So we've broken this down into some different sections for you. Um, the first box you see with the online learning is where we're gonna look at the most this morning. Um, those are kind of the master lists of everything, right? And then some of the other categories we've built for you are merely ways to think about our recommendations maybe for training materials for some of these audiences or particular topics that we've heard from you. Again, we'd love to get your feedback after you go back and start playing with this. Tell us what are the other things that you'd like to see here, whether it's another audience that we can compile some training resources for or another particular topic area that you'd like us to see, see us add to that. And we've also kept the K materials here. Uh, we know many of you are using those internally right now for training and have some interest in them, so we'll keep those up for a while. Those will eventually come down simply because we're not maintaining that content. And the more time that passes, you get to some inaccuracies in some of that older training material. So the start of the show is our online lessons now. So in this table, you have the entire curriculum that we've been building. Not all of them are currently hyperlinked. You'll see we, we are putting it up as we go now, but we had enough mass that it was time to, to release it to all of you. So if you select a lesson here, that lesson will simply start to run in a new tab or window. So you can send all of your staff to just do these lessons here. You say, well, wait a second. How do I know that they've actually completed this training? Well, number one, they can't jump around. Even though they've got a menu here, you can't jump forward. So you are going to have to at least go through all the screens, right? Because at the end, they will get a little record of training completion that they can then print, right? So it's one way. Now, if you want to control this tighter and you say, hey, I'd love to have these lessons, put them in my own learning management system, or on my intranet and manage it that way, send us an email. We will send these files to you. You can load them into your systems. 
In fact, I'm talking again tomorrow to the FDA, who has already done this with a bunch of them. So we're absolutely interested in working with you to figure out where is the best delivery mechanism for your agency, but knowing that if you have no other alternative, send them to our website, have them do the training there, they can compile their certificates and move on. So the other thing I wanted to bring to your attention is um, a couple specific things at the bottom, right? So you'll see in L1, L2, L3, we've been talking for many years about these three levels in the new curriculum. That's what's going to be required for the new records officer credential is passing through each of those levels. Anything you pass on our test, you won't take that training. Anything you don't pass, we'll have you complete that training, finish that level, move on to the next one. Again, that's where that coach from our staff is going to guide you through that process. So if you have expertise on 90% of it, guess what? You're only going to be doing 10% of that training, what you need to learn to get the skills and knowledge to do the job. At the end, you see some stuff with a G. These are kind of general, if you will, lessons that aren't specific to the curriculum, but we thought would be useful potentially for you. And so we're putting some of the things that we're building for other agencies up here as examples for you to see what are the possibilities going forward or where I can be working with the team at NARA for some of our training needs. Um, so I'm going to pull up this lesson we did for originally for the National Endowment for the Arts. And now we've repurposed it, rebranded it, made some adjustments for USDA. Um, one of the nice things is we can do this all very quickly. Um, and so we've got a project going on right now to do this for CMS where within about an hour of getting the email from them, I went in, rebranded this, changed the color scheme to match them, put it up where they're online giving us the content changes that they want us to make. And then once we get through that back and forth, we'll package it up for them to either run on their own website or put it in a learning management system. So again, this particular model is very easy for us to work with you on reusing things we've already built. So when you get into this a little farther, jump to this lesson, you'll see it's largely text-based delivery, but those lessons you saw on that big list, well, we can drag them right in here. Let me get to the bottom here. So this lesson comes at the bottom as a practice activity that's in the overall curriculum. So when you see those lessons on that long list and you're like, hey, I wish we could have one, five, seven, and nine packaged up with some, some integrating text to explain the pieces and how they fit together, we can do that for you. And we can do that pretty easily. Those are the kinds of ways that we're hoping that we can take the work we've been doing on the bigger curriculum, adapt it for you, and make it work for the training you need to do with the folks in your agency, right? And then we're also looking for your feedback on what's next. When you go back and look at that long list, what's missing? What are the topics or lessons where you're like, you know, we really could use something on this other thing that's not there yet? We're not going to build onesies for every individual agency. But when we start hearing four, five, six agencies asking for the same topic, now we know it's time for us to sit down and figure out Get on a work plan. Let's build some training for that topic that people need. And that's where we're hoping to work with you going forward is to take all the stuff we've done, figure out where we can repackage, rebrand for you easily. In some cases, it's not easy for us to make those changes, and we'll tell you that. But other things are fairly quick and easy for us to do. And then also look at what's next. What else do we need to add going forward that meets your training needs for the folks in your agencies? So. Good news is, this is not a demo site. Go to archives.gov when you get back to your office, play around with it, it's all here for you. And then keep an eye on it. We will be adding almost daily lessons. One of the things that, that we had to do is go back and rebuild things that in the early days of building this curriculum were done as webinars. We're almost through getting all that converted to self-paced lessons that we get on, that can be up here. And then for levels two and three, Many of you have participated in our pilots. Um, as we wrap up, in fact, Friday, Jill is getting the last lesson. Last lesson. So that'll wrap up the initial build. Then we'll circle back on 
your feedback from levels two and three, make some revisions and get those out this fall on the website. So again, by the end of the calendar year, all of these rows in this column should be complete. A couple other areas that we'll be building out as we go. So the first one is done, videos. All of our content that's been on YouTube for years, we built that into a single list here again so that it's one-stop shopping. Um, on this particular page, we've even put in a little search button. So if you're not familiar with just using Control F and searching that way, you can use the search box to a particular topic you might be looking for. The two pieces in these master lists that are not built very yet are job aids and practice activities. We've got all the content. We've got to go back through where they're buried in all these lessons, pull them back out, update some things in them, and those will get listed also. The job aids, a lot of them are going to be step-by-step -step how to do different things. So again, a quick refresher. Somebody may not need to go through the training, but they can download a checklist or a worksheet that helps them do a different thing. When you go to these pages by audience, all we've done is try to take a subset of those bigger lists that we think are appropriate for a particular audience, organize it there for you. Again, looking for your feedback. The other thing we've done on this page is also include links from NARA's website for other resources that may be available. So good news, a lot of stuff out and available for you. Um, again, can't thank our team enough. Great work they've done to be doing all of this while still teaching all those classes that your folks have been attending. Um, so with that, let me, um, let me take your questions, and I think we flip back to the slides, too, because I think we've got a couple closing sides coming up. So any questions for Jill, Michelle, or I on anything with training? Our India one? Let's go with our yeah, we'll we have we have a couple online uh, through the chat. Are agency records officers who are grandfathered in from the certificate requirement also grandfathered in from the credential requirement? Do you want to take that one, Michelle, or you want me to handle it? Okay. So um, the the key thing is, if you've got the certificate, you will have to do a renewal, right? So we're going to essentially say the certificate is a ready equivalent to the new credential. You're good to go until we get to January 2023, which is the first time we're going to ask any rec agency records officer to potentially do a renewal. So you're covered, but you will have to do a renewal of the new credential, even if you've got the current certificate. And the second comment is the, the second item is more of a comment than a question. Uh, it's from the joint staff. We could really use war records management within DOD in the joint community large enough to be, it's large enough to be included. The war records would also include classified records management requirements. Absolutely. So if, um, you know, we'll try to keep this in all of our brains, but also if you would send us an email, um, that's a good way to, to make sure we uh, keep up on, on those things. And I'm looking at Luz, if you can remind us the next time you, you contact us too, that'll be good for us to, to work with you on potentially. All right, questions in the room? Up there, oh, there is, sorry, gotcha. Hi, my name is Andrea Jenkins. I'm from um, Jersey Lee Music Alliance. So the records officers have a requirement to be certified. Okay. What about the managers we work for or some of the higher levels that make the decisions? Because a lot of times we'll bring to the table what the requirements are. And there's this tug of war. Yes, yeah, so absolutely a challenge, right? So that is a challenge. Certainly our goal is to work with your senior agency officials for records management and make sure they can be your champion internally with that. So as Lawrence mentioned earlier, we're happy to meet with your SAOs, make sure they understand what's expected of them, the things that we're hoping them to do inside your agency in supporting you and then hope that they then can work with your other managers inside your agency to, to make those decisions. So um, that's where we sit today. We are going to hopefully work on building some training for senior agency officials, both the ones for records management and more generally. Uh, we've had some initial conversations this year about what might that look like? What are the training needs? So we're hoping that might help you with that also. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's probably a conversation between 
our executives, Lawrence, our general counsel, your senior agency official, that is the immediate solution that might help you get past that barrier. Yeah, because I, I believe that the managers that the records officers fall under should have the same type of requirement. Absolutely, and I would encourage you, I can give you an, an easy solution today, right? My easy solution today is, you yeah, got all these resources on the website, what your agency does with them internally is totally up to them. So if you can pitch to somebody internally that, hey, all the supervisors that are oversight of our records management staff should also do some of this training, pick which lessons you think they need, package it up, and now you've got the solution. So that is one way to potentially get at it. Hard part's selling it sometimes, right? Other questions? Yes. Hey, Rich. time you're willing to spend to help people on these issues I mean what if, if you wouldn't be spending hours and weeks to help somebody set up their training would you so I think we're gonna take that case by case in fact it's something Jill had in her slide that I actually took out on her so Jill I'm sorry um, you know do we have limited resources to do this absolutely and so that's kind of the thing we're gonna think about is how much can we devote based on what we're hearing from your needs to any particular thing and then what is that thing? So again, if we've got five or 10 agencies all asking for the same product, yeah, we can probably invest more of our resources into it. If we have one agency asking us to put 120 hours into you know, helping them teach something, we just don't have that kind of time probably. So that's where we'll negotiate with you, what's reasonable and feasible for us. Um, in fact, some of the comments we got back from CMS were on some of those embedded learning modules and some changes they wanted to them, I can't do them. I can't do them cost effectively. I can do all that text, I can do a lot of things around them. That's a limitation for us, right? So that's what we'll take on early in this. And frankly, part of this is us hearing from you enough to understand what are the needs and what is reasonable for us to support and what isn't. And because we haven't had those conversations yet, we have some pretty good ideas about what some of it might be. And we also know you're gonna come up with things on the table that we had not thought about. So we'll work with you to figure out the right scope and scale of what's feasible for our support. And I do want to clarify one thing there. Um, you know, as a reminder, when Jill said that local travel, we are not coming to teach. Just a reminder that we're there, we'll observe, we'll make recommendations, we'll help your instructors in terms of skills if we can critique them, um, but we're not gonna come out and teach classes, right? The content's there on our website for people to learn from. We'll help you use that, shape it, um, but that is a limitation that we absolutely have based on the guidance that we've been given for moving the program forward. Yep, yes sir. Sammy Hill again. Yep. Could you go back to your, um, it's kind of like the people to train slide. Let me see if I can go back. It was, like a, it was a list of people on the um, right that side. That was on the website. Um, so let's talk about it without bringing it up so we don't right. have to switch back and forth. So I thought she was going to go there, but you took in away the ability to train records managers and made it an agency records officer training course with slides to treat, to train records, record requirements to the workforce training, right? So, so we, I don't know that we've done anything on the website that changes how you train people. So um, let me clarify. Yeah. Before, um, everybody in this room was ability to attend the KSA classes and be trained on records management, how to do records management effectively. Right. You've taken that and put it at an individual training level, but now the, the records management program staff, where is our training for making sure we stay current on the ability to run the program of records management? That's absolutely embedded in there. So if you look at the tasks that would be there for the third level of the curriculum, that's all about running your records management training pro or program. So for example, one of, the, one of the items there is how to develop a strategic plan for your records management program. Another one is how do I conduct a self-evaluation of our records management program. So although what you saw immediately, the bottom lists are fairly simple skills, when you get up to the top of that list, it is about running your records management training program. Absolutely. From from a manager, like, right, if, right. For you as the records officer to manage the program in your agency. 
Okay, so next level down. So you have your agency records officer. Right, so is this is the real question that you can't have those other people get the certificate? Is that the real question? Okay, yeah. so the answer is, the answer is NARA is not gonna track people through a training program other than records officers. What you create inside your own agency to require other people to do training is up to you and again, you can use those training resources. So depending on what your liaisons do, you can take them through all or some of those lessons and create your own internal program, your own certificate for your agency based on those training requirements and handle it that way. The only issue is we're not tracking people through it. Simple as that, we cannot do it anymore. Sir. McClemens from MSPB and I wasn't quite sure where to go, but there was one that said for the different audiences, like all staff for the record liaison, and then there was the part that said for the web catalog. Is the web catalog part of the targeted audience, or is that separate, or like where do we go? So if you are a new records officer, you're going to, and this will be coming out in our guidance, you'll reach out to us, we'll reach out to you to get you into the training. But that list you saw on the, the whole online lessons list, that's the exact same curriculum that the new records officers will be worked through. So exact same lessons, right? Did that answer your question? No, I was, I was confused as to, like if I'm the records officer and I need to change my staff, do I go to the... So if, I would recommend you start with thinking about what does your staff need to do? Right, because it will be different for each agency with how you've done your staff responsibilities. And then look at that full listing of the online lessons okay. and determine which one is of these give them the skills and knowledge to do what they're assigned to do in our agency, because it will differ. We've put stuff at the custodian liaison and records officer level based on your feedback. But we also know that each of you have your staff set up slightly differently with different delegations of responsibility. So you can absolutely handle it that way. And I see Lauren.